You know, when you think about the glory of God, uh, I, I, I'm certainly reminded of Moses, and he asked God, let me see your glory, and the glory of God is just so powerful. God said, you, won't, you can't handle it, uh, but I'll let you see my backside, and even then he hides him in the cleft of the rock and covers him so that, that the glimpse of the glory of God is so majestic. John, when he got a glimpse, he fell as a dead man at his feet. I think of the Mount of Transfiguration when they see a little bit of Jesus' transforming glory and Elijah and Moses are there and those Peter, James, and John are there and, and they're just taken back with the majestic beauty of the transformed Christ in His majestic glory. But let me just say this. One day we too will be glorified as He is. And when we want to see the glory of God, what we're really saying is give us a little resemblance of what we may become. Uh, we, we're certainly not the finished product, but thank God that God is still working on us. Amen. And the glory of God is something that, that if, if we would desire to see it, God would reveal his glory to us. But the problem is we're so afraid that it'll dramatically transform us that we hardly ever ask God. When's the last time you asked God to see his glory? When was the last time you said, God, let me see really transcendent who you are? Reveal it to me because we're afraid to because what it'll absolutely do is transform our life. That's why the mount, uh, when Jesus was transformed, uh, uh, it, it, it was life-changing for those three inner circle apostles. And, uh, and it just kind of ties in with the glory of God. In, in Jesus' day, uh, they had the temple worship. And in the temple there was, it was divided into certain uh, sections. There was the court of the women, the court of the Gentiles. Then there was the Jewish men. Men and women did not get to worship today, uh, in that day, the way that they do today. Uh, they all had to cover their head. And then there was the, the, the altar or place of sacrifice. And then there was the inner sanctum. And then there was the Holy of Holies. The Holy of Holies was covered with a veil that they say it was so thick uh, it's where the Ark of the Covenant was. Uh, it had the rod, the manna uh, in that, as well as the law given by God. And Moses was in the Holy of Holies. And it was said that was the place where God dwelt. Only once in a year was a high priest able to go inside the Holy of Holies. And they said tradition tells us that they would tie a rope because the glory of God was so profound in that place that if he died, no one could go in to get out and they would pull him out now we don't know if that's true or not but the veil separated the glory of God from the people and the high priest would go in to make intercession let me give you a little secret about the glory of God when Jesus Christ died on the cross and said they tell us died is finished the temple veil that they said 12 team of oxen couldn't pull into it was so thick was torn in half and there was an earthquake and that holy of holies was open and the glory of God was no longer found in the room but the glory of God was hanging on a cross for you and me <laughs> The real glory of God was hanging on a cross. If you want to see his glory, look at the cross. That's why Jesus could say, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto me. And I'll be a savior to all people, for I love the whole world. Well, this morning, <laughs> that's not the sermon. <laughs> but I'm going to talk about communion and I've got, a, I, I've got a very simplistic, down-to-earth down kind of clip that will help us understand a little bit more about communion. Because communion is not what most people think it is. It's not a church tradition. It's certainly not a ritual, at least not at this church. It is something that's very special. But watch the clip, and then I'll be back, and I will share with you uh, just a little word on what communion is and a little history behind it. It's called the Lord's Supper. And that always struck me a little funny. Nobody eats supper anymore. It's always dinner. What's for dinner? Let's go out for dinner. You know who used to call it supper? My mom when I was a kid. It'd start getting late. The sun would be sliding down the horizon. And I'd be out riding. 
not heading anywhere in particular. Well, that's when Mom would start calling. And I could stall for a while, take a couple more loops around the block. Michael, supper! So I'd head for the house, stash away my bike, and dash on in. Michael, what have I told you about slamming the door? Sorry, Mom. OK, go wash up for supper. So I'd go and wash up, sort of. I could zip those hands under the water without even getting them wet. And I'd go stomping back into the kitchen. Wash them again. I just did. Let me see. Well, I'd turn around and shuffle back to the bathroom without even showing her because we both know what she'd see if she looked. This time I really scrubbed. And you know, standing there scrubbing, I could see what she meant. Those hands were dirty. Grease and dirt and mud, just filthy. I liked it, but Mom didn't, so I scrubbed and I rinsed and I dried. And I ran back to the kitchen where Mom just wanted me to sit still and wait. I could be watching TV or playing video games. Who wants to sit and watch someone mash potatoes? Although Mom and I did get a lot talked about during those five minutes. She talked to me about my schoolwork, if I'd been nice to my sister, all that stuff about being kind and responsible and watching her just moving around the kitchen, working so hard on supper. I could really feel her love for me. I guess that's where I began to understand that family supper time is important. Hey, hon, how's dinner coming? Good. Ready? Sooner or later, everybody else showed up. And even though she wasn't quite done, Mom would sit down, and we could say the blessing. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this food. Thank you for providing for our family. Dad's prayers were very real. We weren't just flying through some ritual before diving into the food. We were talking to God himself. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So Dad would ask the Lord's right, blessing, and then he'd ask my mom to pass the fruit salad. Usually about then, I'd start reaching across for the rolls, which Mom always seemed to put on the far side of the table. Okay. Wait your turn. So I waited and passed the fruit salad and the potatoes and the green beans until finally those rolls came around. That was kind of tough for me, but you sort of figured out that everyone else was hungry too, and no one's gonna let you starve. Well, finally we got to eat, and it was worth the wait. Mom put everything she had into her cooking. You could taste it, although it's surprising I could taste anything slamming down those huge mouthfuls so I could get to tonight's TV show. So I'd slow down a little, and I could see that Mom and Dad had lots to catch up on, so I'd chug down my milk and gasp those all-important words. May I have your excuse, please? Yes, you may. And I'd be free. So that's what I think of when I hear the word supper. Someone who wants me to come home to wash up, to enjoy being clean more than I enjoy being dirty. Someone who wants me to sit just for a little while and think about my life, how much I'm loved, some quiet, serious prayer, passing plates so others can be filled too, small bites and careful thinking and those all-important words. May I be excused? And the awesome resonance of the answer. Yes, you may. And being free. That was one of the sweetest clips I've ever used. And it'll make your supper time certainly more unique and different. If you have your Bibles, turn to the book of 1 Corinthians chapter number 11. 1 Corinthians chapter number 11. And I want to just share with you a little bit about communion uh, as you're turning there. 
this is the first record we have of the church. We understand they probably have had it more often, but this is the first recorded record of the church having the Lord's Supper. Now, if your mind is reeling, say, no, it was the upper room. That's when it was instituted. But the church itself in practice, the first time we find of application of it being read, uh, written about so that we can read it is right here in 1 Corinthians. And let me just say this. The church at Corinth got it wrong. And Paul is writing the church at Corinth to correct the way that they had done their business. And I believe many churches today get communion wrong. Because nowhere in Scripture does it tell us how often we should have communion. Nowhere in Scripture is it mandated that a certain person lead communion. Nowhere is it mandated that, that people are excluded from communion. What we're to do is when we come together, we're to do whatever we're going to do and honor the Lord scripturally. We're to do it in remembrance of what He has done for us. We don't do it for our own welfare. Communion is a celebration. Communion is a time where family believers come together to share the Lord's table. This is not my table. This is not Grace Family Church's table. This is the Lord's table. You do not have to be a member at Grace Family Church to partake of communion here. But as we get back and we think what it's all about... The sharing of of bread and and the fruit of the vine, the bread is a symbol of Christ's body. You know that. He said, this is my body which is broken for you. As we drink the the juice or the wine, and some people say, could you use wine? They did in that day, so it would be acceptable. Uh, You might even have communion in your own home. You don't have to have it at a church. Matter of fact, in the early church, that's where it was instituted, in the homes of believers. And if you're going to do it at home, it can be the head of the household that leads communion. And each time, uh, maybe um, dad could do it once and then mom could do it once. But each person in the home could have a role in communion. It's not mandated for the pastor to do it. My point is this. If you're the spiritual leader of the home and you want to bring your family closer to Christ, then communion can be something that you do. And you can do it. What communion is not... Again, it is a celebration of what the Lord has done for us, and I'm going to talk about that, and and then I'm going to talk a little bit more. But what communion is not is not salvation. Some people teach that if you have communion, it, uh, it brings you the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. No, if you're going to have communion, you need to be saved and have experienced the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. What communion does is bring you to remembrance of what he did for you and how you acted on that. Because, see, what he did does not resonate until you receive it. He's just a good teacher and a good preacher who died if you don't receive it. He was just a good man. But when you receive it, it makes him your Savior. It gives life. It breathes life into the body of the believer in remembering what Christ has done for. So it does not save. It is not a meaningless formal ceremony. Someone shared with me, I think Justin shared with me this morning, there was a a church he attended, and they had communion every Sunday. Now, I'm not here to say that's wrong, but I'm here to say it becomes wrong when it becomes such a formal, ceremonial thing that you do it just to say, I check the box. Communion should be a condition of the heart because in Scripture, we're found that before we can come to the Lord's table, we need to make anything that's not right in our life right by confession of any sin that's in our life. Maybe it's an attitude. Maybe we've just wandered far from the Lord. It's no gross sin, but our mind has not been mindful of Christ. So it it, it is certainly not salvation. It's not a meaningless formal ceremony. And the Lord's table, when we come to the Lord's table, I like what the clip said. It's a time of cleansing. As the little boy had to wash his hands, sometimes that's what we have to do as believers. I mean, we've been bought with a price. We're not our own. Christ owns us. But in this world that's dirty and full of sin, we sometimes get dirty, don't we? We just do. We don't mean to, but we do. And sometimes we have to cleanse our hands before we come to the table. And and so uh, the Lord's table is a place where we come to to find that, that, that cleansing feeling, that time of may I be excused from the table that we want to hear, yes, you may. 
So whatever we have, we, ha we, we, we can celebrate it at the Lord's table. But there are some things we need to leave at the Lord's table because it's a time of celebration. It's hard to celebrate when you've got a lot of stuff on your mind, isn't it? <clears throat> you ever been to a party and you've just been down and you just couldn't feel like you were whole? Uh, sometimes people come to church that way. They come to church and they just can't feel apart because they're so down. Or maybe they're so unclean they think in their mind. Or maybe they think they've been so wrong that they can't be forgiven. Or maybe they think that they're not loved. But I'm telling you, when you come to the Lord's table and you celebrate communion, you can truly celebrate that you are loved and that you are forgiven and that you are excused and that you can be clean. But there are some things we need to leave at the table. Because if we've been all of those things, we have no right to carry what I'm going to say with us. We have no right to carry it away. Because when you come to the Lord's table, you need to leave all your guilt. I hate to feel guilty, don't you? You wrong somebody, you do something wrong, and you feel guilty about it, and you carry it for days and weeks and months and sometimes even for years. Being guilty is, is not good. It would be one of the worst things you'd ever hear in a court of law. Guilty. When we go to the court of law, we want to hear what? Not guilty. Not guilty. And you need to leave all of your guilt at the table because communion does not save. And because it does not save, as, as we, we look at what communion does, uh, communion <clears throat> speaks of salvation. Communion is evangelistic. When we come to the Lord's table reminded of what He has done for us, it makes us remember that He died for us. Now, I can't explain why He did, and I can't explain especially why He died for me, but it speaks of salvation. It's a good time to come to faith in Christ. This morning, we're going to have communion. We're going to unveil this little white sheet, and you're going to find in it some cups that have juice in it, grape juice, and you're going to find a little wafer of unleavened bread in it. And we're going to break it, and we're going to do it together. But for we that are believers, it is a time of celebration that Christ died for us. And what he did, he did for us. And we don't have to have any guilt because our sins have been forgiven. Amen? I think it's important that we understand at a time of heart searching for believers, as you think about what he did for us, it makes us think that, that we were so unworthy. And, and, and it makes us ponder. Have you ever pondered like me why he would die for you? I mean, I mean, really, have you ever thought about that, why he would die for you? He didn't die because you were so good looking. He didn't die because of the big checks that you can write to the church. He didn't die for you because of all your talent. He died for you because he loved you. Think about that. He loved you when you were at your worst. He loved you. And what a great time to do communion on Valentine's Day. It's a great expression of love. And see, it's a time when we come as believers, when we come uh, to confess our sins. Let me give you a verse of Scripture. In 1 John 1, 9... Matter of fact, I'm going to start with verse number 7. Uh, verse number 7, as we look at this, in, in 1 John uh, uh, 1, 7, it says this, But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his Son, cleanses us from all sin. Everybody say all sin. Do you understand that little word all in the Greek, any way you want to interpret it, any theologian you go to, that word all means all that it contains therein. It's the encompassing all, all sin. He cleanses us from all sin. All of your past sins, if you are a believer in Christ, have been forgiven. All of your current sins, if you're a believer in Christ, are forgiven. And every sin you will commit in the future, the payment for your sin has been paid and you are forgiven. When it says all sin, I believe what the Bible says. All sin means all sin. I don't have to have any guilt because all my sin has been forgiven because of the blood of Jesus Christ. And when you drink that cup today as a believer, I want you to understand, you need to leave your guilt there because he paid it all. And he paid it sufficiently, and he gave it all. And when he said it is finished, ladies and gentlemen, it was finished. All your sin debt has been paid, and you are guiltless, and you are free before the throne of God. You need to leave your guilt there this morning. If you read on down the next verse, 
because as he says in verse 7, his, the, his Jesus Christ, uh, the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. Verse 8 says, if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. One of the greatest acknowledgments that you are a believer is to recognize that you have sin in your life. And sin is going to still be with you. You're not sinless and you're not perfect. Aren't you glad because you do sin, your, your sin debt has been paid. And he said, if we say we have no sin, the truth's not in us, and we deceive ourselves. But look what he says in the very next statement. If we confess our sins, and that is plural, not singular, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Now think about that. A time of heart searching for believers, understanding that we can leave our guilt at the table because all of our sin has been forgiven. We confess our sins and he's, he's faithful and just to forgive us. In confessing our sins, we are free from guilt. John 8, 36 says this, If the Son therefore make you free, you shall be free indeed. Now think about that. If you know the truth, the truth will set you free. And if the Son makes you free, you'll be free indeed. Free from what? Free from guilt. Now, I want you to understand, in your person, you may feel guilty, but when you come to that table today, I want you to leave your guilt there because all of your sin has been forgiven. And if you confess it, you'll walk away from that table with no guilt in your life. You say, you don't understand how bad I am. I may not understand how bad you are or what thing you did, but I do understand this, that all my sins have been covered by the blood of Christ. And I'd much rather believe God than believe you. And I'd much rather build my theological thinking on what the Bible says than what you feel. And you better think what Scripture says because the enemy will tell you you're not worthy, you deserve to be guilty, and, but if you confess that sin, you will leave that table with all guilt. And ladies and gentlemen, there's no better feeling because, see, it, let, me, let me put it this way. Remember the time you came to Jesus Christ, the very first time, and how clean you felt when you walked away. When we come to the Lord's table and we celebrate that, the feeling that we're supposed to have is that renewing feeling that he died for us and you're no longer guilty. Think about that. What an amazing time, supper time, family time, coming together as a household of believers. One person, not one. Yeah, I like the movie Blue Bloods. How many of you like Blue Bloods? Uh, the best part of the show, of course, I like Tom Selleck. I mean, uh, he gives all of us old men hope that we'll still look great at that age. Amen. I love, I, I, love, I love watching Blue Bloods, and, you know, my son's a cop, and it's a cop show. And the show always ends, always ends with the family having a family meal. And there's something always wonderful about that family time. Are they dysfunctional at, at times at the table? Absolutely. But before the show goes off, they always get their dysfunction worked out. That's what the Lord's table will do for us. And we all can leave there with no guilt. That means we all walk out of here clean. Now, if you're visiting today and you're not a believer in Jesus Christ, every believer in this place would say, you're welcome at our table. And you can leave guiltless too if you'll confess that sin, amen, and trust Christ as your Savior as we've trusted Him as our Savior. Let me give you the second thing because I think it's important. You not only can leave your guilt, but you need to leave your grudges. <clears throat> I don't know who said that especially loud, but I'll be praying for you. Amen. No problem. <laughs> Amen. <clears throat> you need to leave your grudges. Because I want you to think about it. And I was going to show a clip, and I thought different about it. You know, I love the passion thing that Mel Gibson did, and he gives the most vivid display of how Christ really was treated that day. By the way, I mean, that, that was the actual way it was done. And one of the amazing things in the clip, and again, I, it, it's sometimes a little harsh, but while they're actually, actually nailing him to the cross after that incredible scourging and the beating and all of those things, and after going on the Via Della Rosa, uh, all of that, he, he makes a statement, Father, forgive them. Father, forgive them. And when he's hanging on the tree, he's saying again, Father, forgive them. I don't know about you, but I'd have been a little ticked at those guys. <laughs> I'd have been a little bit upset. But he said, when you come to my table... You can't have any grudges when you leave it because all of your sin has been forgiven. 
And the same way that all your sin has been forgiven, you can't have a grudge. And see, we're celebrating forgiveness. That's what we're doing coming to the table. See, we were saved because he forgave us of our sin. But the Bible said the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. You had to be forgiven. You had to be forgiven for violating God's law for being an enemy against God, and you trust in Christ, the sinless, perfect payment for our sin. And how much of our sin has been paid? All, past, present, and future sin. And it comes with forgiveness. And you cannot, ladies and gentlemen, I promise you, if you can't forgive someone and you have a grudge and you cannot forgive them in this place today or outside this place today, I'm just going to tell you, you should not partake of the Lord's table. Because it comes with condemnation. And Paul even goes on and writes and said, Some of you are sick today because you've taken unworthily. If you have something against someone, you need to make it right today. Whether in prayer or going through that individual and say, Hey, I, 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 I have forgiven you. I hold no grudges. Everything is straight. Everything is good. Because if you don't, it's just a religious ceremony. And communion should be a time of, of, of that, that heart examination. And see, his death purchased forgiveness. We receive this forgiveness by faith. And we can forgive because we have been forgiven. In Luke 23, 34, Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. You might have a grudge today, and you've never, never asked the Lord to forgive them. And you've never forgiven them yourself. And you, you are absolutely in trouble with God if you don't forgive them. Absolutely. And, and think about it. We've never been wronged the way the Lord was wronged, but he still could say, forgive them. Think about it. Jesus forgave his crucifiers. We can also forgive our enemies. When Jesus came on the scene, he said, it's easy that you love those who love you. How many would give me an amen on that? Amen. Let me tell you what's hard to do. Love those and forgive those who hate you and who are your enemies. How crazy is that? Phyllis was telling me a story about uh, a, a young man who murdered some Amish children. Just went on a crazy rage and it was up in Pennsylvania and uh, killed six little children, innocent children. They're all little girls. And, of course, his parents and his mother was devastated. The father actually was the one that called and turned him in when he founded this dastardly deed, and they were heartbroken, the two parents of the, of the young man that killed these little girls. And there was great grief-stricken. And, of course, they shot the guy. When they got on the scene, they shot the guy, and he died too. The astounding thing about the story was when they had the funeral for the young man, every one of those Amish parents of those six girls that had been slain showed up to pray for that mom and dad whose son had killed their children. And they said, they said this, we forgive you. And we don't want you to feel any guilt because our Lord has forgiven us. When you can get to that place in your spiritual life, you can say, I'm truly a mature believer. That's what the Lord's table is all about. You say, I don't know if I could do that. Well, then I'm telling you, you would not want to be where Matthew 6.14 says because Matthew 6.14 says this, that if we can't forgive those who have hurt us, then the Lord's going to have real problem forgiving us. Forgiveness is someone or, or something that we should absolutely express, and we need to learn how to forgive. It's the way of Jesus. He said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life, right? They all go together. And no man can come to the Father but by me. And we come to that table. You've got to leave. You've got to leave your guilt, and you've got to leave your grudges. In other words, you've got to show forgiveness. Why in the world wouldn't you want to forgive somebody anyway? If you're, if you're a child of God, he forgave you at your very worst, so you can forgive other people at their very worst. And most people, when they are at their worst, that's when they act the stupidest. I've acted stupid a lot in my life. What about you? I've needed forgiveness from many people many times. What about you? And there's nothing greater than walking away with no guilt and no grudges because you're clean. Remember that little boy washing those hands at the dinner table? Think about that. You also need to leave something else when you leave the table. Guilt, grudges, here's one that's going to hit us all. You need to leave your bitterness. You can't come to the Lord's table and be bitter. 
Lord, why is this happening to me? Lord, why is this circumstance here? Lord, why don't I have this? Lord, why, 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 why? You can't be bitter when you come to the Lord's table because it's a celebration of what he has done. He said, do this in remembrance of me because, see, if you come and you have bitterness, you're doing it in remembrance of you. You got it? This ain't about you. It's about what he did how he set you free, how he forgave you from all of your sin. And the message of the cross removes bitterness. No bitterness in Christ despite his suffering. The example of Jesus given by Peter in 1 Peter 2.19. Turn there, if you would, 1 Peter 2.19. By the way, if you're visiting, you come to this church, you better bring your Bible or your iPad or your phone because we're going to use our Bibles here. Here's the example of Jesus given by Peter about bitterness. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse number 19. Let me see where it is. For this is commendable if because of conscience toward God one endures grief, suffering wrongfully. Let me ask you, did Jesus suffer wrongfully? He, he, he was sentenced as a criminal, and he suffered wrongfully. For what credit is it if when you are beaten... For your faults, you take it patiently. But when you do good and suffer, if you take it patiently, this is commendable before God. Now hang on. For to this you were called because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that we should follow in his steps. Verse 22. He who committed no sin, nor was deceit found in his mouth, who, when he was reviled, did not re revile in return when he suffered. He did not threaten, but committed himself to him who judges righteously. For who himself bore our sins in his own body on the tree, that we, having died to sins, might live for righteousness, but whose stripes you were healed. For you were like sheep gone astray, but now have returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. In other words, Peter's writing saying, Jesus, when he was mistreated, and when he had all of this stuff to be bitter about, the Scripture says that for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross. He didn't cry out. He wasn't bitter. He didn't do any of that. He didn't do any of that. And you say, well, he was on the cross. He cried out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? You know what he's doing? He's quoting prophecy from, from the Psalms, the 22nd Psalm, saying this has all come to fulfillment. He's quoting Scripture. He's not being bitter. He's asked the Lord uh, to forgive those who have done this to him, for they know not what they do. He's committed his mother to John and John to his mother. He, he, he's not bitter at all. He is absolutely thrilled about getting his life for you and me and doing the Father's will. So my point is this. When you come to the Lord's table, don't be bitter about where you're at. And let me just say, we all have something we could be bitter about, don't we? Health issue. Financial issue. Relationship issue. Just life, life can be hard sometimes. Loneliness issues, you can be bitter for that. Children issues, you, you can be bitter about so many things. You can be bitter about life didn't turn out the way that you wanted it or you didn't achieve a goal. You can have bitterness, but when you come to the table, it's not about you. You've got to leave your bitterness there because Jesus was the example that we have. And we can be bitter when we, how can we be uh, bitter when he endured such pain and he was never bitter. He said, do it in remembrance of me. Honor me. Focusing on Jesus, we can leave bitterness and embrace forgiveness. Because, see, when you, when you embrace forgiveness and you leave your guilt, there's not really, at the end of the day, nothing to be bitter about. Really not. If we're heaven-bound and hell-proof, we ought to be the happiest people in the world. We should have joy unspeakable, full of glory. We should. We should have peace that surpasses all understanding. And by coming back to the table and having family time, we come to the Lord's table. Sometimes we can talk about how difficult this world is. But when we experience what Christ did and we remember what he did for us, we can say, I'm going to let the bitterness go because he did it all for us. And remember, we're just passing through this place. This is not our eternal home. This is really not the place where we're going to live. We're going to live in Christ forever and ever. So you've got to leave your guilt. You've got to leave your grudges. 
You got to leave your building, your bitterness, and you got to leave your burdens. So many people come to the table and they're worried to death and they have all of this stuff going on in their head and going on in their mind and going on to where they really can't focus on serving God. We try to do it through worship music, but it's hard sometimes for people to let go. There are other people let go very freely. We try to do it through a sermon, and sometimes people hear and they know what they need to respond to, and they don't respond. We try to do it through an invitation. The reason we give an invitation is so that you can have time to do what God has told you to do through the worship and the, and the message. And it's a time where you can release any guilt, any bitterness, any lack of forgiveness, and any burdens that you might have. That's why we do it the way we do it. It's all for you because that's what he wants. He wants you to be free from carrying those burdens of sins. Yeah. That's what the old hymn says, there's power in the blood. Would you be free from the burden of sin? There's power in the blood. There's power in the blood. I mean, you think of the choruses and the songwriters, what they wrote. It's all about releasing yourself. But here's the deal. You hang on to it if you don't release it. You keep it. It's your baggage. Your sin becomes your baggage and it holds you back. I say give it up, come to the Lord's table and be, be clean. I, I say let it go and, and leave here guilt free. And you got to leave your burden. See, Jesus cared enough to die for us and then to send the Holy Spirit. He didn't leave us as orphans. He left us with his presence through his spirit indwelling in us. And his Holy Spirit abides in us forever. And he cares enough to keep us day by day. The cross shows how much he loved you. He spread out his hands. I mean, the scripture simply says in John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him will never perish but have everlasting life. God loved you at your very worst. He loves you today. Nothing can separate you from God's love. And when you come to the table, you need to remember that. His cross proves his love. But not only that, he tells us in this life to cast our care on him because he cares for us. If he didn't care for you, he'd have never died for you. He'd have let your nasty butt go to hell. You say, you shouldn't say that. That's the truth of the matter. He would have let you go to hell. He would have not have provided a way. He would have not left his home in glory, took on the form of a servant, and gave his life. You know why he did that? Because he cares for you. Don't, don't tell me nobody cares about me. There is one that cares for, for you more than you can ever fathom. Greater love than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends, Jesus said. And no man takes my life, I freely lay it down. He loves you. He cares for you. He did it for you. And when you come to this table at communion, you need to remember all the things that he did. And you don't need to have those burdens floating around. Cast all your care on him, for he cares for you. You know what that is? Cast. Take a net and cast it out. Cast it out to him. Lord, here they are in a net. All of my care is coming to you. And it says you do it. Why? Because he cares for you. Do you think he does not know what's going on in your life? That's why, he, that's why Paul teaches, be anxious for nothing, but in all things, with thanksgiving and supplication, make your prayers and requests be known to Christ. And he'll guard your heart and mind and give you the peace that surpasses all understanding. You know why? He cares for you. He died for you because he cares for you. And he cares for you because he loves you. Don't you, don't you care for the ones that you love? You can say, I love somebody, but I'm not going to care for them. That's a beautiful picture. Is that your baby? No. That's somebody's baby, but you're caring for it. <laughs> you're just rocking that baby, taking care of that baby. Now the baby's looking at me. Thumbs up. <laughs> you can say, I, 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 I love this baby, or I love this person, or I love this. But if you don't care for them, that love means nothing. Just idle words. Jesus said, cast your care on me, for I care for you. The problem is we walk around with so many burdens. I mean, I love what he said. He said, look, when you're overworked and weary and heavy laden, put my yoke upon and let me take care of it. For my burden is light and I am meek and lowly. He said, in other words, just let me have it. Let me do the work. And you quit carrying the burdens because he loves us. Everything in his life was because he loved us. And the burdens that we carry, we need to learn to let go. I'm guilty of carrying burdens. I carry the burden for everybody. I'm one of these guys who try to fix it for everybody. I can't. 
And I, I'm so busy trying to fix it with everybody, I tend to forget about my own, and I start carrying all my own instead of saying, Lord, here, you take this. You have to leave your burdens there and cast all your care on Him. See, making communion meaningful is up to you. It's not up to me. You can come and you can take the cup, you can take the bread, you can do it all that we're going to do. You can. And you can fool me, but you can't fool him. And just remember, it's because he loved you. And when you come to this table and you celebrate, what you're celebrating is the great love that the Father has for you. And I want that to sink in a moment. The great love that the Father has for you. And on this Valentine's Day, when we celebrate the word love, you'll never see it expressed. I don't care how many strawberries dipped in chocolate you buy your significant other. Or how many fancy dinners or roses or whatever you do, it'll never express the love that God has for you. I got a little clip as we close. Watch this and I'll be back. Love. 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 Love in this world is pretty messed up. It asks for a lot and it never returns the favor. Love in my world? Well, it brings more trouble than it's worth. In my world, love has felt like... Sabotage. It flees into the night. It, it, it leaves at the first sign of trouble. And it never feels like I love you no matter what. Because love in my world, it leaves. And when it leaves, there's only disaster left. Oh, well, promise is a lot, but it doesn't deliver much. It breaks hearts. I've picked up the pieces of my broken heart one too many times. So I build walls. Love isn't worth the tears. The pain, the loneliness. The surrender. It's exhausting. Even when you try to do love right, love fails. I have made a mess out of love. What good is it? You can't help me. Why well, love it all? Why do I even try to love? Why sacrifice to carry the burden? Why? 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 Because there is a perfect love. Perfect love that can end the disaster. A perfect love that can heal the brokenhearted. There is a love that saved those who are dwelling in this messed up world. God tells us about it because we wouldn't recognize it if it showed up on our own doorstep. It's a love that takes its time. It's profound. It doesn't brag or bad mouth. God's love is like a shield that we know will never leave us. That you can trust. Hoping. And you never, ever exhaust it. That's his kind of love. And it never fails. And while we were keeping records of wrongs and self-seeking and being unkind, he still died for us. How can I love like that? How can I love like that? How can I love like that? because I am loved like that. I can love well, not because of me, but because he first loved me. I wanna to speak to anyone in this place this morning that does not know Jesus Christ and has, has felt his heart-piercing, soul-cleansing love. 
Would you bow your heads with me this morning as I want to just give anyone that's not a born-again child of God, that's never received the love of the Father through the payment of Jesus Christ, I want to give them an opportunity to become a Christian here this morning, to experience God's love. On this day that we celebrate love, the greatest expression of love we've ever seen is when God takes on the form of flesh and we behold his glory through his life-giving death for us. And this morning, with every head bowed and every eye closed, you say, Pastor Mike, I'm not sure if I'm a believer. I've never, or maybe I've never accepted Jesus Christ. I didn't know someone could love me. I didn't know that God loved me. I thought I had to be good for God to love. But this morning, I want to trust in that God that you're talking about. And, and I want to believe that Jesus died for me. And would you pray for me, Pastor? Would you pray for me that I might receive the love of Jesus Christ? Is there anyone like that? Just slip up your hand where I could see it. Put it up very high where I could see it. I see one hand in the middle. Is there another hand? Just put it up high, and I'll pray for you. Put it up high. I'm not sure if I'm a believer. I'm not sure if I'm saved. We've had one. I'm simply going to ask you to do this. I see another one. God bless you. Praise the Lord. You can put your hand down. There's another one to my left. That's three. You raised your hand, and I know that was hard. But in order for me to do this correctly and to do it right, maybe you would just stand, and I'll send someone to pray with you. Pastor Matt, Pastor Ray, you guys be ready. And if you're serious about experiencing God's love and you want somebody to pray with you, the prayer of faith simply saying, God, I trust that you sent your son to die for me. They'll pray with you. They'll not force you to do anything. You don't have to sign anything. You don't have to be made a spectacle of. But if you raise your hand, if you would, there's two standing already right over here. Praise the Lord. Pastor Ray, you go. Just stand right now. If you say, I want to receive Christ as my Savior, I'd love to have someone pray with me. God bless you right on the front right here. Praise the Lord. Matt, you come on. Okay. Uh, We've got, praise the Lord, we've got Annie, Ray, we've got, praise God. That is so, so amazing. See, God's love permeates barriers. It's bigger than any barrier. It's bi bigger than any religious system. It saves, it, 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 it saves anyone and everyone. His arm is far-reaching. Nothing's too hard for the Lord to do. Three have stood today to say, I want to receive Christ as my Savior, and I want to embrace His love. Is there anyone else? Because... They're going to be able to come to the Lord's table today and leave all of that guilt and shame and, and, and burdens and, and, and be clean when they leave. Is there anyone else say, I want to receive Christ as my Savior? I don't, I don't mean to push. I don't mean to. I'm just giving you an opportunity. That's for those that did not know Christ. Now, I'm assuming the rest of you are either two things. You're either saved. You're either saved or you're an apostate. And I don't believe you're an apostate. I believe you're saved. But this is the time in the service that if there's anything in your life, if there's anything in your life, you need before the Lord <clears throat> before we come to his table. Remember 1 John 1, 9, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. This is the time. This is the time. I'm not going to ask you to come to the altar. This is what I'm going to ask you to do. I'm going to ask you right where you're at just to stand, and right where you're at, I'm going to pray over you that your issue will be taken before God. Not hear everybody's heads bowed. Just stand right there and say, Pastor, I want to pray. I want anything in my life that does not honor my relationship with God. <clears throat> People are standing all over the building, and those are the ones where the truth really abides in them because they are acknowledging they have something in their life. Because you're going to be able to come to the table worthily because you have confessed any sin according to Scripture. You're examining your own heart. You've not confessed it to me, which you'd never need to anyway. You are examining your own heart, and it's between you and God. And I want to pray. Virtually everybody in this building is standing. Let me pray for you right now as I pray for myself also because I'm in your boat. Things that I have to confess. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time where we come into your house 
to receive forgiveness. And Father, we ask you to forgive us all of our issues. Though there be many out there this morning, there's so many, but yet you know each and every one before we even acknowledge, but we know it pleases you because we have acknowledged their sin in our life. Father, I'm asking you to forgive me where I have failed you. I'm asking you to forgive these, these, these good people, these kind people, these redeemed people where they have failed. And I pray this morning when we come to your table, we will truly celebrate the love and forgiveness that you did for us. And we will be so thankful for our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Father, we trust in your forgiveness. We trust in your goodness. We trust in your mercy. And we're going to come to the table of grace to receive all that we need this morning and to be filled. Father, we ask for every person that is standing that all of their guilt be taken away we ask that you give them peace that surpasses all understanding we pray that all sins will be forgiven according to your word and we pray this morning that we would leave here different and changed than when we came in in Jesus name I ask these things Amen and amen. You may be seated. Praise the Lord here this morning. Yeah, you can give the Lord a hand clap offering for that one. I'm going to ask uh, Jim Birmingham and Dave Wright come and remove uh, the covering, if you would. I'm going to ask, I need five deacons up here. It doesn't matter who comes. I want to ask you guys to come. And here's how we're going to do this. These guys are going to just take that, kind of fold it, leave it there, and then they're going to hand out the the plates to the deacons. The role of the deacon in the church, the word diakonos, simply means servant. Now, I'm sure you guys thought the, the definition of deacon meant money counter, but it doesn't. It means servant. It means servant. And if you are from a Catholic background and have recently joined Grace and said, I'm going to be a member of this church, you might know communion as the Eucharist. And it's really a time of giving thanks. That's what that means. It's a time of giving thanks. So I'm going to ask these men, if they would, just to take a tray, move to the part of the building, and I'm going to ask the head of every household, You might be male, you might be female. If you're single here today and you're the head of household, then you come get the the vessels that are necessary, okay? Bruce, would you spread to that side? You and Sean go there, Bob and Jim right here. I I want you guys just to stand because what I want, Terry, I want the, the head of the households to come forward to receive it, okay? Because this is symbolic. If you can learn to do this, you can learn to do communion privately. So the head of every household, you just come and get whatever's necessary for you and your family. And then we're all going to take together. We're all going to take it together. And for those three new people who received Christ this morning, you are certainly, this will be your first communion, and it'll be an important one. Bruce, you can uh, send that tray, and they'll replenish it. They have, they have plenty more to re- replenish. No one's going to be left out. There's always room enough at the master's table. Ken, is your tray empty?
We want to make sure everyone is served. So, Jim, if you, did, if you, if you need... If you need communion, just raise your hand, and we have guys that are bringing this good number of folk coming here. Can bring it on once you have a partial supply, and we'll refill the others. Praise the Lord. We got still people still waiting over here. Ken to the, my far left. Hey, this is a good problem to have that we got so many folks. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. We do not want anyone left out. <laughs> Terry, over to, the, to that side. Once you have it, you can be seated. Fellas, don't forget yourselves. Serve one another. So everyone, everyone has a cup. I hope there's some still being served on the back. You know, they do this for sanitary reasons, but I think sometimes we can get, we can get, I think, I think too politically correct. <laughs> I'd love to have communion where we really have baked unleavened bread and we really pour from a cup, one cup, that we all can partake. Not that we all drink from one cup, but that we pour from one cup and do it differently because sometimes I think because this is commercialized, it takes a little bit away. But this is the way we have to do it. It's symbolic. But I, I will promise you this. In the future, we're going we're gonna to have some of the women bake the bread. And we'll fill up some pitchers with some fruit of the vine. And we'll be able to do it. And we'll be able to come and, and do it the right way. Or the way that I think would be more meaningful. The only way you can do this and do it accurately is just read the Scripture and do what it says. And if you want to know the story about communion, it's in 1 Corinthians chapter number 11, starting at verse number 17. That's where you get the rebuke. He tells them that they've been taking unworthily. And they would have what was known as the love feast. True. It's called the love feast. And all believers would come together and they'd bring potluck and they'd bring supper and they'd bring dinner as they'd celebrate. But as they started to practice it more frequently, it started to get in little fractions or cliques as we would call them. And the rich would migrate over here and the middle class here and the poor over here. And there'd be many that would be left out or be very meager and the rich would be having their thing. And then they were supposed to go to the Lord's table and Paul said, that's wrong. When we come together, we're going to come together all under one roof, under one banner, and that's the banner of the love and forgiveness of Jesus Christ. There's nothing that separates us, not color, not social economic standing, not, not sin conditions, because we're all sinners. There's none righteous, no, not one, and God is no respecter of persons. And he said, you've been doing it wrong. And he said, I'm telling you, you need to examine your heart, and you need to do it right. And you need to have that time of forgiveness, and we've done that. And then it goes down and it says in verse number 23, he starts and he gives the institution of the Lord's Supper. He gives a little divine instruction. In verse 23, it says, For I received from the Lord that which I delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the same night in which he was betrayed, he took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body which was broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. So if you would take just the top little seal, a little clear plastic seal, and I'm going to break the bread, and then I'm going to pray, and then we're all going to eat together. He said, this is his body that's broken for us. It's symbolic. And if you would, take yours out, and I want to pray and ask the Lord and give him just a, a, a prayer of thanksgiving for doing what he did for us. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you gave Jesus for us. And Father, we certainly wish that his body was not broken for us but it was the way 
that which you punished him so we would not have to be punished. And we thank you by his stripes on that broken body that we are healed. And we thank you so much for that sinless, perfect life that he lived. And Father, we thank you for giving him for us. And we celebrate him and what he did, that it was not in vain, it was for your glory. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Let's all eat of the bread together. And he said again, you do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he also took the cup after saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And again, if you'd pull back the little foil wrapper. His blood was shed for us. His body was broken so that we would be healed, but his blood paid our sin debt. Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin, the Scripture says. And his body was poured out for us. And when we do this, we're remembering that we're saved by the precious blood, as we read in 1 John 1, 7, for all of our sins, our past, our present, and our future sins. So let's partake and honor the Lord, saying, Lord, we remember what you did, and we give thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's drink together. And then they celebrated and celebrated and celebrated till the sun came up. So let's stand and give the Lord a hand clap offering. <clears throat> come on, you can do better than that. Let's celebrate that our sins have been forgiven. Celebrate. Let's celebrate for those three folks who gave their heart to Jesus Christ this morning. And let's celebrate that we are clean and we can serve God with a clean conscience. God bless you. See you next week. Praise the Lord.